it seems a lot of um, media people have already um, spoken a lot about um, the media space. So I'll try to be as brief as possible and leave the stage for those who are very eloquent. I don't talk a lot. I'm usually a behind-the-scenes person, so that's where my strength lies. Today, I want to tell us a story about Africa. Not the, usually, um, the usual glossy stories that you see on The Economist or the pages of um, Bloomberg, um, CNN, and the rest of them saying Africa is rising. It's a good story, but I always think otherwise. I've written a lot of um, articles disputing the fact that Africa is rising. I rather think that Africa is an entitled continent, laid back and trapped by its entitlement mindset and mentality. I make bold to say that it's not um, a very good statement to say, but I say it anywhere and anytime. A few weeks back, someone asked me, what are you doing gallivanting around the continent? What are you looking for? As at the time I was asked that question, I didn't um, particularly have a clear-cut answer or response to that um, question. But perhaps if I were to go back to the point where that question was asked, I would say that I'm trying to share my thinking and my passion with the continent. And what's my thinking about? I think it's high time that Africa stood up and owned its story because we are shaped in the direction of the stories that we tell or the stories that are told about us. Two weeks back, I was involved in a media research for an international organization. And one of the things we are trying to do was to find out consumer behavior and user perception around media in Africa. So we used an application to track every moment, every time someone from Africa ever complained about the media in Africa. And 99% of all of the results we got from the process were young people, old, a lot of people around Africa, even media professionals, journalists from around Africa, everybody was complaining about international media coverage of Africa. Why does CNN only tell the story of poverty the story of war, the story of famine, the story of diseases about Africa. I want to believe that amongst us here, we've all made that statement at one point in time or the other. If you've never made that statement, can you raise your hand? We all do. At every point in time, we are all complaining. Why does CNN give bad coverage of the, of the continent? Why is it only war? Each time I go on CNN, the only images I see of Africa are negative images. I struggle to make that same statement. And each time I see it, each time I see people make that statement, I think that we are all entitled, trying to renege our responsibilities and let someone else tell the stories that we are supposed to be telling about ourselves. But I've spent a considerable amount of time also trying to study the politics of our stories, both on the international level and the local level, to understand exactly why the stories that are told, are told, and what motivates people to tell the kind of stories that they tell. Before I go into that, I would start by sharing a personal experience of myself growing up in this very city of Port Harcourt. I would sing a song, and I would like every one of you to sing with me. Now, sometime in the, um, I don't know again if it's early or late 80s, I was in primary school, township school three, Moscow Road, if you ever attended um, Township School 3, Moscow Road, let me see you with your hand. I'm alone. OK, anyways, something happened while I was growing up as a young child here in the city of Port Harcourt. My life was being shaped by a particular song. A particular song meant that I wasn't going to be anything much more than the details of that song. I will please ask you that as I sing, you sing with me. So you understand why a child that did not know so much would cry about a particular song. And it was a song that anytime someone feels that they need to make you feel bad, they just start singing that song. It's a song that captures derogatory statements about different regions in the country. But when it was time to capture something about River State, it was only the Ogoni tribe, which I come from, that was, was captured. I guess by now some of you have an idea of the song I'm talking about. Kalaba, Didiapo. 
Igbo play wayo. Hausa beggy beggy. Yoruba pick and chop. Sing now. <laughs> now I need you to sing it. You used to sing it to me. I used to cry. Now I need you to sing it. I cry no more. So I need you to sing it. I won't sing. Just sing. Kalabati diapo. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Exactly. <laughs> so, it was really interesting growing up. Every time from primary three, four, five, six, anytime they start singing that song, I'm dead. I will cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. I never understood really why I was crying. But as I began to grow, let's say primary four, five, six, something began to happen. I began to feel like I wasn't going to amount to anything more than being a palm wine tapper or a palm wine seller. Now, part of the lived stories of the Ogonis back then was that any office you walk into, the cleaner is usually an Ogoni person. The house help in every house is usually an Ogoni person. The security man is usually an Ogoni person. So I have looked around myself. Every of these people that I see shaped the image and the perception that I had of me. And most times, what happens? People, the, the amount of information people see, what they see is what they use as a descriptor for you. So it becomes a tag. It forms the stories that have been told about you. I won't go into the issue of um, the Niger Delta and the perceptions around the Niger Delta youth and everything. My, exp my first experience um, in Lagos, um, I think sometime around 2005 or so, the moment I mentioned my name, someone said, where are you from? I said, River said, oh, you're a militant. That was the first expression that came forth. I won't go into that. I'll stick with my Ogoni story because there's a whole lot about that story that shapes most of the things I do today. Now, there was a perception that everybody from Ogoni is either a truck pusher, a security man, a gate man. There was just that negative attachment to that which shaped my whole outlook to life and everything. And it became the story, what everybody knew. And I guess as you're seated here, you also know deep down in your heart that each time you hear of an Ogoni person, that's the image that comes to your mind. But something happened sometime 22 years ago. There was a local crisis here in Nigeria that had a proportion of, an international, that had an international proportion. Ken Sarawiwa was killed. He was from Ogoni. The crisis and everything was about Ogoni. And then what happened? A different story was being built. So every time people think about the death of Sarawiwa and all of that, I think about it differently from the stories that emanate from that one single activity. So I remember sometime back, um, sometime last year, I walked into an office in Lagos and I mentioned my name and someone asked me, where are you from? I said, River State. He said, where in River State? I said, Ogoni. He said, oh. Those guys, they are usually very, very intelligent, very brilliant people. You know Sarawiwa? I said, yes. He said, yes. Sarawiwa was a very good writer. He was a very good poet. And I smiled. Because one negative activity turned around the entire story of the Ogonis. So each time somebody from Ogoni goes out now, the image that, uh, that is attached to that person is the image of Sarah. We were the image of someone who is intelligent, the image of someone who is smart and someone who is brilliant. That, exact, that story was the foundation of most of the studies I was doing in media in terms of the politics of our stories. I was trying to really understand this and I think some time ago, um, Ross Alabot George, he's seated somewhere in this hall, I don't know. He made a post on Facebook where he said, all politics is local. That statement struck a chord, and I began to research that statement, and I figured out who made that statement and why that statement was made. Um, Tip O'Neill, Tip O'Neill, an American politician. So I kept studying that statement, trying to put parallels in place, and what happened? I stretched that, that statement further on my own, and I said, all politics is local, all stories are global. And I'll explain what exactly I mean by that. The story of Sarawiwa and the death of Sarawiwa here in Port Harcourt was a very um, um, local story. 
it was something that happened as a result of our local politics here in Nigeria. But when it happened, the story itself became global. The story became global. And this began to, um, for the first time, I realized that this is exactly how every story that is told about Africa, anywhere around the world, is told. The stories we have about Africa, as a result, they are all products of our local politics. They are products of the way we do our politics here. So if you look at, um, if you look internationally anywhere else around the world and the way politics is done and the way they live their lives and everything, America has shaped its future way back through Hollywood, power and ambition and everything. If you look to the West, politics is done as we versus them, America versus China, Russia versus America, Russia versus Gi um, um, Germany and the rest of them. Everybody is struggling for one thing or the other, play the role of dominance, power, and um, opportunity, economic opportunity, basically. The new race right now is the race to Mars. Everybody is running to Mars, we versus um, the rest of them. China wants to be there, America wants to be there, Russia wants to be there, but what happens when you look back home? It's us versus us. And that has been the secret to every story that you see being told about Africa. It's usually us versus us. Africa is a continent that lacks ambition. So our ambition and our politics is usually localized. And it has created the kind of stories that have been told about us. So I want to put myself in a situation where I assume that I am, I, I am an American journalist. And I am visiting Africa for the first time. I touch down in South Africa. I touch down in Congo. I touch down in Kenya. And I touch down in Nairobi. And for every place I visit, let's assume that I visit five cities or six cities. For every place that I visit, there is an ongoing crisis. There is an ongoing war. There's famine. There's poverty all around the place. What do you think will influence the stories that I will tell? Exactly what I see, your lived experience. I did not create the experience for you. I met the experience and I report the experience that I see. So the only way to change that is that we have to own our stories, live our stories and change the story. If I am an American, I'm writing about Africa. It's my story, it's my media. If you think you want to challenge my story, you build your own media, you build your own story. One of the ways to build your own story and change your story is by the kind of politics that we live, um, that we play here in Africa. So each time, the election seasons are around the corner again. The newer stories that will be told beyond 2019 will be shaped by the politics of 2019. I listened to, um, sorry, I have to mention um, Ross a lot. He did a video, um, a pre-event video, where he was talking about the future of Nigeria beyond oil. And when I saw the video, I smiled, I laughed. It's not because I'm always pessimistic, or I do not believe in the country, or I do not believe in, in Nigeria. But I think that most times, just the same way we do aid. For those who are in the development community, we do aid, entitled to aid um, from everywhere around the world. It's the same way we are entitled to somebody being a savior to us. And it's part of the reasons why you see the American journalist would come here with a white savior complex. Because he has been seen and treated as a savior. He has been seen and treated like every story, every problem we need to solve can only be solved if the white man is involved. So if the white man is not involved, it's not good enough. There are TV channels, there are TV stations that are owned by Africans, but I guess, and I can tell you here, that you would prefer to watch a CNN to an African um, um, TV station. I know the reason for that, but I won't go into that. That's an issue for another day. We did a research that found out most of the reasons why that, um, why that happens. So basically, for me, that has been... It has been my passion, it has been my agenda. Moving from country to country, moving from place to place, trying to think about why we do the things we do, why we, tell, why we shape the kind of stories that we shape, and the outcomes. We cannot live our lives, we cannot live our lives as Africans, as a continent, expecting that someone else would shape the stories that we live by. Because we move in the direction of the stories that we tell and the stories that are told about us. Our stories mobilize us, our stories demobilize us. So if we want to build a story, if we want to shape a story that mobilizes us, then we have to do the things that shape the kind of stories that are told about us. But if our politics is local, 
If our politics is, is detrimental to the kind of stories that are told about us, what happens? It demobilizes us. So every story of, or every narrative of Africa rising is false because it's based on false premise and the false um, metrics. We don't want to go into economics where we we'll start um, calling the numbers or um, going into um, economic terms. But basically, Africa is not rising until it rises above the pettiness of its politics. That's the only time Africa will rise. So this has been the basis of the stories that we try to share and the stories that we try to create, the people we try to meet and talk with to understand why they do the things that they do. We are taking our um, agenda next year beyond Africa. We are going to America next year with the same agenda, with the same purpose. Now, one of the things um, I'm passionate about when um, it has to do with anything beyond the continent is because I have also discovered that the story of the black man anywhere on the planet is tied significantly to the story of Africa. If Africa does not rise, the black man anywhere will never rise. The black man anywhere will never rise. Why? Because there's no respect that goes with the stories that are told about you. Each time I think about Africa, I think negatively. I think about famine, I think about poverty, I think about crisis. So if the black man in America is suffering from racism, it's because he's not respected. If Africa rises and becomes a major player globally, Africans everywhere around the world will be respected. So you cannot even talk about Africa rising without factoring in all of these parameters. So like I was talking about um, the, the, the entitlement mindset when it comes to media and the, and the way people expect other people to tell their stories. It's not only internationally that this happens. Even locally here, it happens. So if, um, here in Nigeria, you see every other state complaining. Why does the media only tell positive stories about Lagos, but it doesn't tell positive stories about other cities? Some of us seated here, I have some of your posts on Facebook where you've made a similar statement. Once I see that ice cream grab, I save. I have a folder where I save all of those. Why does the media not tell good stories about Port Harcourt? Why does the media not tell good stories about Enugu? Why does the media not tell good stories about Cross River State? Lagos built its story. Lagos owns its story. You have to build your story. You have to tell your story and rise above whatever story is attached to you. So if you think that the, the stories that have been told about you out there are not representative enough of you, then you build your own media. Then you build your own media. Oh, you tell me that your media does not have the kind of coverage that CNN has. The ongoing politics in the Middle East right now between Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the rest of them, if you follow the stories, you realize that media and storytelling is at the heart of the crisis. Saudi Arabia wants Qatar to shut down Al Jazeera. And I assume and I guess rightly that every one of us here know Al Jazeera. It was a lo local media session that was started in Qatar. And it has become a global media brand. What happened to Arrest TV being a global media brand? So you can tell the stories of River State without feeling entitled that the media outfits that tell the stories of Lagos should be able to tell your own story. What happened to Arrest TV covering what happens around Africa from elsewhere around the world? But no, we are an entitled people where we wait for someone else to come tell our story. Someone else to be the, sto uh, the savior to our stories. So even in our individual lives, what are some of the things that has happened around us that has shaped the stories, shaped the way we live, whether we will be successful or not? You can make every step, take every step towards changing that story. You all know of what we did um, I've been trying as much as possible not to mention some personal things on stage here, but what we did with Touch, um, Touch Port Harcourt, it came as a result of me always feeling less of myself, feeling inadequate with myself while I was in Lagos some uh, many years ago. Because the perception out there was that people from Port Harcourt, we are lazy, we are idle, did not want to walk, did not like to walk. And it was 2009, social media was just starting. And it was the work I do. So I said, okay, why don't we just leverage on this and build a storytelling platform that will be designed to tell the story of the city of Port Harcourt? And we did. That's how we started. And I know the places 
where TouchPH has been written about as an example of how to use um, digital media and technology to tell the story of destinations. That's how to challenge a story. Because one of the things I've discovered trying to study and, and, and look at this carefully is that whatever you attack, you lack. So if you attack the media because the media is not telling your story, you feel a sense of inadequacy for something you lack. And the only way to bridge the gap is to build your own media. And like Chino Achebe said, if you don't like someone else's story, tell your own story. Thank you.